Hey Hams, this is Kevin, AD0IM, and today is Saturday, March 18th, 2023. Uh, earlier today, I went over to Bill's house, WA0CBW, and we built a 10 meter dipole uh, without a ballon um, using just a few pieces, just a few parts that should be pretty easy to get for you. And we're going to show you how we did it. Coming up next, stay tuned. All right, so here are the parts for our uh, our home our homemade dipole. We'll start at the top here. We've got three uh, dog bone insulators. Uh, one of those is going to be used to actually bring uh, both ends of the antenna together, and the other two will be used to secure it uh, in whatever orientation you decide to uh, decide to in implement it in. Uh, the next thing we've got is a little piece of RG8X uh, with a a uh, female UHF connector on it. Now, you know, people that have been doing this a lot longer than me will tell you this is not the strongest type of connector to use for this kind of thing. And I agree with you because I've accidentally pulled them off. But uh, we, we made a tactical decision to go with this because we're going to be helping 20 different people build these things. And uh, A, we didn't want to have to do any soldering in class. So Bill and I got together a couple weeks ago and we made 20 of these feed points, <laughs> which was uh, just a, just a hoot to do all that in one afternoon. And uh, the other thing is, we didn't want people to have to go out and buy barrel connectors uh, to plug their uh, coax into that they're gonna use to uh, run back to their radios. So that's why we went with this. Would I do this for my own antenna? No, I would go ahead and use a male PL259 uh, and then uh, suck up the barrel connector. But uh, we're, uh, we're working with new hams here and this, this may be some people's first antenna. So we just wanted to remove one variable from the equation here. So, so that's why we went with that. A couple of zip ties whose purpose will become clear. And we've got four little wire clamps here that I bought from Amazon. You can get them in lots of 20 for, uh, I forget how much, it's like 10 or 15 bucks. Um, and they'll be used to provide strain relief to the vinyl assembly. And uh, you'll see how we do that. And then we've got uh, a couple of uh, butt splice connectors. Now these particular, this particular model um, the insulation around them is, is essentially heat shrink. And so at the end of the day, we'll go ahead and take a, a heat gun and uh, shrink these things and make a real nice connection uh, on the antenna. And then just a piece of rope, piece of nylon rope that uh, I've already burnt the ends on to make them, make them stay together and not uh, come apart while we're working with them. So, so those are the parts you need for this. There are additional things you can add. You can modify what we're gonna do today. Uh, to suit your liking, that's okay. The only thing uh, we're trying to communicate here today is that you can make a functioning antenna that you can talk, especially in the current uh, solar conditions, great, great distances um, for really just a few bucks, uh, relatively speaking. <laughs> so uh, let's get down to the building and we'll show you how we get this done. All right, we're at Bill's workbench here. I'm going to just show you my hands while we do this. So here's our uh, UHF female end of our feed point. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to take this piece of coax and we're going to divide it into its two core components. Uh, the central conductor, or center conductor, I'm sorry, it's not a train station, and, uh, and the uh, braided shield. And uh, we're going to do that by taking my trusty old 1980s strippers here and I'm just going to use, I'm not going to try and show it to you, it's hard to read. This one has a uh, Three, uh, three settings. One is the inner, um, for getting rid of the inner dielectric on really any coax. But then it's got two settings or, or two sizes for stripping the outer insulation off. One is labeled RG59 and the other is RG6. Bill, are RG59 and RG8X compatible? Yes, they are. They're the same size. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and use the RG59. Now we only need about an inch here, all right? But I'm going to take off a little more than that just so I have some room to show you what I'm doing here. And at the end of the day, we can get rid of any excess here. All right, so let's just give that a good squeeze without getting medieval on it. Twist it around a few times. Let's see if we got it broken all the way through. Those are not terribly sharp, so sometimes they work, and sometimes they require a little brute force. Bill right now is going, you know, I got some stuff that's actually sharp but that's okay, we got it done. <clears throat> now, as with any electrical 
wire, anything that you know is designed to conduct electricity of any kind, uh, you don't want to pull a bunch of wires off it. All right. If when you take your insulation off of anything that you're stripping, and you pulled a bunch of wires out, you have reduced the ability of that wire to carry electricity. And your numbers, you know, you do it if you're bad enough at it, your numbers are going to end up being off. So, uh, so be very careful when you're doing these stripping activities, all right? To make sure you're leaving uh, leaving the wire there and just taking the insulation. So, next thing we need to do is we need to take the braid on this outer shield. And we need to just kind of peel it back, just kind of separate it. We're doing some reverse basket weaving here. All right, and you just want to get it all loose and pliable enough to where we can expose um, the dielectric here that's wrapping around the center conductor. And then at the same time, this will be pretty neat. Bill's handing me a, a pick here. Bill, you want to tell me what the point of that is? Sometimes you can take a pick and use the pick to pull out the threads a little bit like this. Ah. Uh, and then it just makes it a little bit easier to spread them okay. out and get them to where you want them to go. There Bill you go. was apparently a dentist in a past life. Here, give me that back. Because <laughs> he's, got, he's got a whole bunch of these kinds of things. And uh, I don't know where you would get them. I guess Amazon sells everything nowadays. You can get them at Harbor Freight. <clears throat> Harbor Freight. Ah. Ham radio operator's best friend. So, especially here in uh, in our club here in Johnson County, Kansas, a good portion of every get together uh, that we have is spent discussing the latest deals at Harbor Freight, um, which I find fascinating because I've only been in there like once. So, so anyway, all right, we're probably good here. So watch what happens now. <clears throat> I take all this wire and I pull it all to one side, right? Now there's going to be some left on the other side here, but that's okay because we're going to leave this insulation in place here, down here at the very base, so that it doesn't all get together and cause short circuits and all other sorts of ugly things. All right. Then I'm just going to twist this together with all the force that I can muster and just make this braid into a single wire. All right. Now, I imagine if you don't have one of these picks, you could probably use the flat end of a really tiny screwdriver to accomplish the same thing, but uh, that just popped into my head while, or a I was, toothpick. while I was talking. Or a stout toothpick, yeah. Okay. So, this is the outer braid or the shielded braid of a piece of coax. All right. Now, you could probably guess what's coming next. And that is, we're going to expose most but not all of the rest of this. We want to leave some of this uh, center conductor dielectric in place. Now, I just heard a pretty good snap on that, which tells me I may have overdone that. But we'll find out. All right, I pulled a whole bunch of wire out of there. All right, see all that? Not good. All right, don't do that. Okay, be very careful when you're stripping. So there's only half of the... Half of the wires are left in here, and that's not good. That's not what we want. So we want as many of those in there as we can get. So I'm going to redo this off camera, and uh, we'll come back and uh, show you what it's supposed to look like when it's done properly. Okay, we're back in uh, Bill's basement here. Um, all right, I went ahead and redid, redid this end off camera, and you can see the, uh, the center braid or the outer braid has been put back to where it was. We, we ended up cutting about two inches off of this feed point to make room for this. And then uh, I went ahead and very carefully did the, uh, did the stripping of the dielectric uh, protecting the center conductor as I try and find it here so I can show you that we got it off clean. There's no uh, loose wires in there. So that's what you want it to look like. Now, I didn't trim as much of the dielectric off this time as I did last time because Bill reminded me that when we go to splice these two wires, uh, these two now independent wires, to the radiating elements on our dipole, um, I don't need very much wire at this particular end. I want them to be the same length, generally speaking, but I don't need as much exposed here as I have exposed here. Okay? Make sense? 
So <clears throat> we're going to uh, we're going to talk about measuring uh, antenna wire here in just a moment. Be right back. All right, so we're going to uh, start making antenna wire here for, in a minute. But I wanted to show you something that uh, Bill and I just did. We took a piece of this rope that most of the hams around here, and I'm sure around the country, use to hang their antennas up with. And we cut a 17 feet piece of rope off. And the reason we did that is because we're giving a class this coming Friday night at our next club meeting. And like I said earlier, we're going to build 20 of these antennas. Well, I don't want to spend all night figuring out how much antenna wire to cut off of this big giant spool I have. So we've cut a 17 foot piece of rope. And this is what we're going to use to measure all the wire. And that's what we're going to use today because we're going to build a 10 meter antenna. And the way that, uh, the way that you determine if you're if you haven't read this far in your ARRL antenna book yet, uh, is to take uh, the desired frequency uh, that you want your antenna to be most resonant on and uh, use that with the number 468. So you take the number 468 and you divide that by your, de your desired frequency. Now in this case we want these antennas to work uh, when we're done, done with them Friday night in the technician portion of the 10 meter band which is which begins at 28.3 uh, megahertz. So we're going to start right at 17 feet, and when we tune the antennas Friday night, we're going to trim them back sufficiently to get them uh, in the neighborhood of uh, of where they'll have privileges to operate. Uh, on dipole antennas, you don't really have to get too precise on this, but uh, it's a good habit to learn uh, early on in your ham radio career to uh, to, to measure these things. And, uh, and try and get the antenna as close as you can, remembering that perfection is frequently the enemy of the good. So we're going to take uh, this 17-foot piece of rope and we're going to cut off a like amount of antenna and we'll be right back. All right, so here's one end of one leg of our uh, dipole antenna wire. And what I want to do is I want to, using my fancy stripper here, I want to take just a little bit of wire off a um, little bit of insulation. Whoops, not in frame, sorry. All right, and that's all I should need. I'm going to give this a good twist. Now some people might say, hey Kevin, why don't you tin that wire? It'll stay together while you crimp it. Well, my experience with tinned wire is, is that uh, the crimpers have a really hard time crimping tinned wire because that stuff gets pretty stiff. Now if we weren't using a uh, connector here, that had a whole bunch of uh, you know rubber insulation around it. You could solder the connection after you crimp it together, but uh, we're not going to do that. This is a you know once we assembled this end of the feed point, the decision was made to just make these no solder antennas. So so that's what we're going to do. So I've got these little butt splice connectors. So there's a bunch of names for these butt splice uh, joiners. Uh, I you know I don't know all of them, but uh, but the essential uh, point is is that these are color coded. When when you buy these, you usually end up with a plastic box from Amazon that's got three different sizes in it, and those sizes are all color coded to correspond to the red, blue, and yellow. All right. Now our gauge wire that we're dealing with here today is 14 gauge, so I planned ahead and uh, put 14 gauge uh, butt connectors in all of these kits. So we're going to get this thing on here, and we're going to use the center die here. Uh, which is blue, which matches the color on our connector, uh, to get it crimped on there. Now we have to crimp it twice. We have to crimp it for each side. So what I need to do is I need to crimp the antenna wire onto one side, and then I'm going to stick uh, some of the wire. This is not going in very cleanly. Uh, some of the wire, one end of the wire from our coax feed point into the other end, and then crimp that together. But uh, we'll crimp them one at a time and make sure we get them right here. So it's a pretty small hole in there, but it'll it'll go in there. I hope. It's putting up a fight, Bill. So what's that term when it does this? When the wire goes back on the insulation and bundles up. I heard a really fancy term for that recently on another video. I can't remember what it is. Yeah, it's, uh, it's spooling up back there just a little bit. 
Bill's going to look at this out of frame, tell me what I'm doing wrong. I have made one of these antennas before, so. See if that works. This is not the first time. Okay, that's better. Okay. All right, so we've got that in there. Now we're just going to apply the big crimpers here. Let's see if I can zoom out a little bit. There we go. And we just want the crimper to be on the inside of the flare on the insulation. All right, we're not going to, we don't want to crimp the flare because that won't get us anywhere. We just want to crimp the inside of the connector. Now I'm using the table here for leverage because I don't have both of my hands available. And sometimes these things, the ones that have really soft insulation, they'll stick to your die, but uh, but that's okay. So that's what that looks like after that one side has been crimped. That looks pretty good, doesn't it, Bill? Looks good. All right. Now I can give a pretty good tug on here, and if it comes out, I'll be very embarrassed, but kids, it is not coming out. So that's good. All right. So I'm going to turn this around. And I'm going to put the business end of this center conductor into the other one. All right, and that's too big, so I'm going to cut just a little bit of that off. I don't really want any extra wire exposed, even though that we're going to heat shrink that connection. I really want this thing to be as tight and clean as possible. So put that in there. Let you look at that. That's in there pretty good. All right, so now I'm going to crimp that. Using the same method, leave the flare on the insulation exposed. Give it a good tight crimp. Okay. All right, <clears throat> now the beauty of this situation is, is that now that this end is crimped, this is cut off. It is isolated from the center conductor, and there's no way those two are going to come in contact and short out our antenna. But at the end of the project, we'll do some other work just to show you how to really make sure you don't run into that. So uh, let's see about getting the other end done here. Actually, we'll do that off camera. We'll be right back to show you how it looks. All right, so we got the other end crimped on here. And uh, these are both really good crimps. These connectors aren't going anywhere. We're going to get a heat gun out here in a minute. We're going to shrink these on here real good. But one of the things that, that's going to come up because uh, while these antennas are not meant, uh, when you build them this way, to really become permanent outdoor installations, they're just, they're not incredibly sturdy. They'll work. Uh, I like to say it's a great first antenna, but it's not going to be your last antenna. It won't even be your second antenna because, you know, we're all smart people. We had to be to get our licenses. We're going to figure out better ways to solve some of these problems. And I'm going to let Bill shrink wrap these connectors while I film it because this is really exciting stuff ladies and gentlemen Alright, so we've got that done. Now, Bill, what, what's the one thing we haven't solved on this? <clears throat> one of the things is how do you insulate or weatherproof this part of the connection? And there isn't really an easy way. <clears throat> the best thing that you can do is just the best that you can with some black tape uh, that you can wrap around there. I can get the thing started here. And you can kind of go down the middle with it on either side and then begin wrapping around it and back up around each individual one. I think that'll probably get the job done here. Again, this is not your last antenna, it's your first antenna. And, and uh, also, oh, go ahead. the last thing you want to do is leave a little tail 
and don't stretch it, now just wrap it around and it'll never come undone. When you try to break it by stretching it, it will eventually pull its way loose from what you're doing. Because you put a whole lot of tension onto that. There you go. Okay. All right. So let's get over here to a stable <coughs> surface and I can show you Bill's handiwork. Sorry, guys. I'm stepping on a piece of wire down there so I can't pull it up. Whoa! I may edit that out. I may just leave it in for entertainment purposes. <laughs> all right. So there you go. Um, you know, you can you can keep going all the way down to the end of these uh, butt connectors if you want, if you, if you want that to look uniform and just to make sure. But these are really good uh, weather tight connections, so you really don't have to worry about these. All right. So this is the feed point of our dipole antenna. Let me zoom back out here a little bit. So let's recap what we've done. Uh, two weeks ago, Bill and I soldered these uh, UHF female ends on all of these feed points. And then today, we took a piece of coax and we took the other end of this feed point and we separated the outer shield or the braid from the center conductor. And we've now, using buck connectors, we have crimped um, one end of these wires onto our, onto our feed point here. And by heat shrinking the buck connectors and using some black electrical tape, we have further insulated this joint. So it does have some degree of weather resiliency. Not a ton, but, uh, but enough to get you through until you uh, get tired of just having 10 meters and you go out and start making or buying other antennas. So the next thing we have to do is we have to take one of our dog bone insulators and we've got to feed each of these wires that we just crimped onto our feed point through one end each of these butt connector of these uh, of these dog bones. Um, the other most common conversation that I've had with people is how to put how to give some strain relief to this configuration here. Now keep in mind all of this wire here counts as part of the antenna, all right? So even if we apply some strain relief here, which we're going to do here in a minute, all of this still counts. So we're not particularly worried about changing the length of the antenna by doing this part of the exercise. We'll talk about uh, how you do affect the length of the antenna a little bit later. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to take these little wire clamps that I got from Amazon. I'm going to take my little nut driver and I'm going to loosen this thing up to where it comes off. This is fun. I like doing this stuff. All right, so I've got the uh, I've got the base of this clamp, and then I've got a washer, which doesn't look like any washer I've ever seen before. And Bill and I were having a conversation about that earlier. It was kind of funny. Um, and I'm going to get these. I'm going to get these two wires, kind of straight, and kind of kind of the same length as before they go through the connector. And then I'm going to fold one back here. All right, and I'm going to stick this boy on there. And get get both sides of this wire in the clamp like so. Now I'm making this a little tight, um, but it's just a demonstration, so I'm okay with that. Maybe pull it down just a little bit. All right, and then once I get it on there, once I get them in there, I'll stick this washer on here. That'll keep the wires inside the clamp after I our nut on and crank the nut in there. All right, so that, ladies and gentlemen, is strain relief. Now, I did this wrong. There's not enough wire on here. Well, there might be, but barely. So I'll fix this off camera, but there needs to be enough wire here to be able to get this to go horizontally from the connection without stressing this point down here. So I'll fix that off camera and I'll show you what it looks like and we'll get the other side done too. But that is essentially the mechanics of providing strain relief for your antenna elements using these little wire clamps that I've got from Amazon. There's other ways to do this. Some people will just take a bunch of wire and tie a big old ugly knot here. Uh, other people will use what they call split bolts, which you can find at the hardware store that operate pretty much like this. But they're really big and gnarly and I just don't like the way they look. And if you're using the antenna for portable purposes, 
you've got to wind this thing up and unwind it, you know, twice a week, take it out on your deployments. And those split bolts really just kind of get in the way. So I like these because they're nice and clean. And like I said, they're on Amazon and I'll try and remember to put a link to them when I get, uh, when I get done with this. So we'll fix this one, make it a little looser and, uh, and get the other one uh, taken care of and then we'll come back. All right, so uh, we've, got the, uh, we've got the center insulator in, and uh, every dipole has a center insulator because they're dipoles, which means there's two halves to the antenna. I think in the Greek there's a more literal translation, but that's what I'm going with because I don't speak Greek or Latin or any other language for that matter. My dad was born in Holland. He didn't teach us Dutch because my mom, who's not Dutch, didn't want a bunch of kids running around the house talking Dutch behind her back. So. There you go. Um, so this is a really sturdy connection. It's Nothing's going to go anywhere. Uh, it's pretty well insulated. We can take this antenna and we can hang it between two trees. And it'll last a few years, maybe even longer, as long as we don't mess with it too much. Help. The next thing we have to do is we have to terminate it onto something that, with another piece of rope going through this end, we can then attach it to some kind of end support or to the ground if you're using uh, this in an inverted V configuration. And this is really simple. The, the way to do this is just take another one of these clamps and uh, apply it just like we did at the top end. Where'd my nut driver go? There it is. I've lost my tools. This video is taking way too long. I apologize guys. I may edit it down quite a bit, including the part where I say I may edit it down. Bill's over here laughing, trying not to laugh on camera. I'm apparently a bit of a jokester. So just so you know, Bill's been a ham longer than I've been alive. I don't think that's technically true, but um, I was born in 1961. Bill, when did you get your first grant? Uh, I was in uh, a freshman in high school. Okay. So about four, 13 or 14? Yep. Okay. But I was in it long before that. I was a short wave listener for uh, ever. <laughs> yeah. All right. So now we've terminated this end of the antenna onto, uh, onto an end insulator. We have center insulators and we have end insulators. If you don't, if you don't use an end insulator, you run the risk of your wire coming in contact with tree limbs, which it's going to anyway if you use a tree, but uh, it, you run the chance of coming in contact with things that you don't really want it to come in contact with, like people, for instance. So one of the things that uh, you always learn when you're designing antennas is to make sure it's designed, uh, if, if installed permanently, to have each end at least six feet off the ground so normal height people don't accidentally walk into them. All right, while you're transmitting, or any other reason. My dog has run into these and just pulled them completely apart. But she's a 90-pound Labrador on a mission when she sees a squirrel, so uh, that's to be uh, understood. So, so this is how we uh, put an end insulator on using the same clamps that we use for our center insulator. Make sense? So with that, I think we have reached the end of the video, and uh, I thank everyone for watching. And I hope uh, we didn't bore you to tears. Uh, I'll try and make this as short as we can when we get it to the end, or when I get into the post-production. So until next time, this is Kevin, Alpha Delta Zero India Mike. And Bill, WA Zero Whiskey, Alpha Zero Charlie Bravo Whiskey. He just made it sound like he had nine characters in his call sign. But Whiskey, Alpha Zero, Charlie Bravo Whiskey, CBW. He's our man. If he can't do it, no one can. <laughs> All right, thanks for joining, folks. We'll see you next time.